Hi, my name is Connie Kaplanis and you're watching the video Third Cranial Nerve Palsy Management. In this video, we'll discuss the variety of non-surgical and surgical management options that we have in relation to managing a patient who has a third nerve palsy. Let's commence with non-surgical options. As usual, we'll need to have options that deal with the diplopia, but in relation to the third nerve palsy, we also have a dilated pupil. So where atosis is not covering the eye, uh, photophobia is also of concern. So this is a consideration that we'll have to make in relation to um, assisting the patient. With regards to diplopia, remember from the previous video, uh, some patients will not have this complaint because they have atosis and for others, the deviation is quite large and therefore the second image is relatively far away and can easily be ignored for, for some patients. Let's start off with the diplopia. Uh, again, we will utilize prisms in this particular instance. Now, with third nerve palsy, because you have an extensive motility issue, it really isn't effective in patients with, say for instance, total paralysis and large deviations. It's more effective in a partial, uh, in a, pa a patient with a partial third nerve palsy and one that has a smaller deviation. So it can be difficult to provide the patient with an area of BSV using prisms and to find a workable area that the patient can utilize. So if, if prisms are an option, then you will move to occlusion and uh, this will often include uh, total occlusion uh, given the extensive nature of uh, what can happen with a third nerve palsy. Now, if the third nerve palsy occurs when an individual is a child, then we need to consider uh, ambliopia and with a third nerve palsy, it's very ambliogenic because their capacity to gain BSV is difficult. So they'll often have, um, or they'll often suppress and therefore develop amblyopia. So occlusion will be prescribed in children uh, for the purposes of preventing amblyopia, uh, more so than perhaps the diplopia. Uh, the diplopia often will, will go eventually and suppression will settle in. So we mentioned uh, briefly abnormal head posture and uh, with the abnormal head posture, if you're going to assist a patient to utilise an abnormal head posture, you want to make sure it's comfortable. And for some patients, it's not comfortable and not an option. Generally speaking, when they have a complete third, then what we want to do is uh, turn their head so that the eyes move into um, abduction or abduction of the eye that is palsied, so we're getting the eye to utilize the lateral rectus, move it into where the uh, that extraocular muscle is working, and hopefully they might have some BSV there. If not, then obviously the abnormal hip posture can't be used, and for some, the head turn is, is too large to be able to, to utilize in any case. With the superior division, you've only got the superior rectus palsy. You might um, have a ptosis there that doesn't cover the visual axis, in which case the patient will have diplopia. And in this instance, the abnormal head posture would be as per our discussion in previous modules regarding um, the principles of incompetent strabismus. So we would turn to the affected side, tilt to the lower row, and we'd have a chin up to move the eyes down. In relation to the inferior division now, all we have left is the superior oblique lateral rectus and the superior rectus. So again, we'll want to move the eye um, that's affected into abduction. So where abduction occurs, the lateral rectus is normal and will uh, often tilt, or the patient will tilt to, to the lower eye. And, and this often assists patients with an inferior division, third nerve palsy. I mentioned uh, earlier that another issue that patients with a third nerve palsy who have pupil involvement will have is photophobia. So in this instance, uh, sunglasses or transition glasses, tinted lenses will assist a patient when they're outdoors uh, in a sunny environment. You can, if that doesn't work, use myotics. So something like polykypene will, um, will constrict the pupil and, and provide relief from photophobia. Patients have also commented that, or some patients have commented that they have relief from contact lenses, and these are contact lenses that are painted, uh, but have a small aperture uh, pupil. So it uh, counteracts the fact that there is actually a larger pupil there. So there's a few options there if your patient has uh, concerns about the photophobia and needs some relief from those symptoms. 
In a patient who has atosis and the ptosis is covering their better eye, so say for instance you have one eye uh, that has poor vision and it happens that you end up having the third nerve palsy in your good eye, then uh, the ptosis is taking away the good visual acuity from the patient. If you have bilateral ptosis, also this is going to be an issue for your patient. And um, you can utilise what is called ptosis uh, crutches, and these are mounted onto glasses, and we can see this here. Uh, they've been mounted onto this pair of glasses here, and they actually hold up the eyelids. And you can see that there's one on the other side as well here. Um, so this is uh, not utilised commonly uh, for patients, but um, it will be used uh, in, in the scenarios that I just mentioned. In relation to Botox, this can assist the cosmesis of the patient. Uh, in many instances, you will not be able to achieve BSV with Botox, and it's because you have a number of extraocular muscles being affected. And more often than not, um, the Botox is injected into the lateral rectus, so we're reducing the exo uh, deviation. In doing this, you're also able to uh, better assess a patient's capacity uh, for BSV, as you've got a small angle there and you can um, work with the patient to, to see their potential for, for BSV. It's more successful in patients with a partial third than it is in a uh, total third. Let's consider surgical management now. Uh, surgical management can be quite complicated in third nerve palsy. And in this particular video, I'm only going to present several options in relation to managing a third nerve palsy. In your reading, uh, you will come across a number of other options uh, in managing a patient who has a third nerve palsy. In planning for surgery, you need to consider the muscle sequelae and uh, determine uh, where the patient has the most troublesome uh, diplopia. We also need to make a distinction between the patients who have uh, congenital third nerve palsies and those with acquired. So a patient with a congenital third nerve uh, can usually have uh, surgery fairly on uh, as it's relatively stable uh, or the disease or disorder is relatively stable. And often the surgeons would want to try and get in early to, to see if we can prevent uh, amblyopia if BSV is an option. But again, uh, these patients are very complicated to, to manage and, and may not be possible to, to get BSV for these patients. In terms of acquired, as per usual, wait for stabilisation, wait for spontaneous recovery and um, look out for apparent regeneration. In terms of spontaneous recovery, patients who tend to recover best are those who've had a microvascular event. Um, these tend to recover better than, than other types of uh, causes of third nerve palsies. In relation to a patient who has a total third nerve palsy, so we have complete paralysis, uh, post-operative post um, diplopia should be anticipated. You're not going to be able to, uh, or the surgeon is going to have a very difficult time to achieve single vision uh, in all positions of gaze. The, the palsy is too extensive to expect that you would have no diplopia postoperatively. So really what you want to do is aim to improve the appearance uh, for the patient, so the cosmesis, and then you want to move the eyes into primary position and give the patient uh, BSV in the positions that they need, which is usually primary and, and down gaze. So in most instances, uh, the surgery is aimed at the exotropia, and then we can look at also the hypotropia as well. You can also add uh, transposition uh, procedures or low fixation procedures, which will assist um, holding the eye into, into position. So partial third nerve palsy is we actually have a little bit more success in because uh, obviously you have some function to these extraocular muscles, so by operating on these uh, muscles we'll actually get uh, a better outcome. So these do better than our total third nerve palsies. But again, be aware that you still may have some limited eye movements post-operatively, but um, you should be able to improve their area of BSV and improve some of their eye movements. So overall, the aim is to improve um, or optimise the position or the range of movement the patient has and improve that area of BSV for the patient. 
There's a note down here too that uh, in relation to utilising Botox, this is where preoperative um, use of Botox can assist in seeing what the outcome might be like postoperatively in relation to one's capacity to, to fuse if the eyes are brought closer together. Let's now discuss some of the options um, for surgery of a patient with a third nerve palsy. And again, just a reminder that this is not an exhaustive list of the options. These are just some of uh, the options that surgeons have, and there are uh, more uh, than what I have listed here. So in commencing with total palsy, this is our most complicated uh, patient who has total paralysis of the third nerve. And often what will be done is a maximum recession of the lateral rectus and a maximum uh, resection of the medial rectus. Now, the lateral rectus is functioning, so that recession will work, but that resection of the medial rectus really doesn't have an effect. Uh, but it's done so that the eye can um, stay sutured um, as best possible towards um, adduction. What can also be done is traction sutures can be used um, to assist anchoring the eye in adduction because usually these patients will drift otherwise back into um, EXO. Here to the right we have some images of um, a patient who's had a traction suture and, and what we see here above is a schematic diagram and here a patient who's had the uh, tra traction suture. So the eye is anchored into adduction and then the suture is brought out from the eyelid and um, uh, tied over a bolster that's um, put on the eye there. This is left there for about uh, six, six weeks in an attempt to anchor the eye um, to prevent it from exodrifting. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these are not the only procedures that can be performed. For a total um, palsy, you could also look at transposing the uh, superior oblique, which is functioning, and the lateral rectus, which is functioning. Also, um, there are options of globe fixation procedures where the um, extraocular muscle is detached and then um, fixed to the orbital wall. So, for instance, you could detach the lateral rectus and um, attach it to the orbital wall, in which case uh, there'd be no abduction effect of the eye and the eye would come in and effectively uh, assist in, in managing the exotropia in primary position. Now, for partial palsies, we actually have some function of the extraocular muscles, so surgery can be more effective. And in this instance, we could um, maximally recess the lateral rectus and uh, resect the medial rectus and get um, some impact on that uh, primary position. We could also look at upward transposition of the horizontal muscle tendons, and this will help or assist in managing the hypo if there's a hypo deviation there. You could also look at um, going over to the contralateral lateral rectus and uh, recessing this and getting some more impact in uh, left gaze. Um, as needed, you might even move over to, to the medial rectus. Again, this is uh, just a sample of some of the procedures that, that could be performed for a, uh, a third nerve uh, partial palsy. If the superior division has been affected, then what we're dealing with is a superior rectus palsy with a, a ptosis. And so we would perform surgery as we would for a superior rectus palsy, which is looking at that muscle sequelae. And so this particular um, procedure for third nerve palsy is a little bit more uh, simple. Uh, we could go for the contralateral synergist and uh, weaken this. And this is often the first choice, um, recessing the inferior oblique. And then we could also look at strengthening the uh, superior rectus, which is palsied, or the ipsilateral antagonist, the inferior rectus, which is uh, overacting. Because the superior rectus is an elevator and the greatest deviation is in elevation, the other consideration is how much of an issue is the diplopia. If the diplopia is only present in up gaze, then you could consider leaving the patient um, as B uh, rather than trying to give the patient BSV in up gaze. So consider that um, how bothersome is the diplopia if, if the patient does actually have BSV in primary and down gaze? This would be a patient um, who has had quite, quite a lot of resolution to the superior rectus palsy or has a very mild superior rectus palsy. 
With the inferior division, we now have uh, all the extra muscles supplied by the third nerve affected, apart from the superior rectus. Again, the main target is the horizontal deviation. So we can recess the uh, lateral rectus, uh, as an example of a right third nerve palsy, and resect the uh, medial rectus and perform maximal surgery on these. And depending on the size of the deviation, its incompetency, we could also look at moving over here to the lateral rectus to have a greater impact in um, left gaze. And then we could also look at uh, the medial rectus here in terms of um, resecting this to assist in, in right gaze. In relation to third nerve palsies, you should always deal with the strabismus surgery first and then the ptosis. The ptosis is obviously protecting the patient from diplopia in that it's occluding the, the visual axis. So it's best to um, consider and plan for strabismus surgery first, consider um, ptosis surgery and any impact um, that either surgery may have on, on the outcome and perform the ptosis surgery last. You could also utilize uh, ptosis crutches to see how well the patient would tolerate any residual diplopia that uh, has occurred postoperatively, which has not been able to be managed through surgical intervention. So those ptosis crutches will lift the eyelids and give the patient uh, an understanding of what it would be like to have both eyes open and a decision could be made um, whether the ptosis surgery then would go forward or not uh, with regards to uh, chasmesis versus function. Note that one of the risks of ptosis surgery is corneal exposure and uh, it is certainly contraindicated if you have a pseudotosis, you should not be performing surgery on, on the lid and also if a patient has a Bell's phenomenon. So the ophthalmologist um, will be taking a look at, at the lids and uh, determining whether there's any contraindication uh, for ptosis surgery. You can see that the management of a third nerve palsy is very uh, complex and it is a formidable task for the surgeon, particularly when we have total and complete uh, third nerve palsies. These are very, very difficult to manage. So you need to expect that postoperatively these patients will still need some assistance uh, with diplopia. And in this instance, we'll come back to those options that we have, the prisms, the occlusion, uh, perhaps abnormal uh, head postures, etc. So bear this in mind that many patients with complex their nerve palsies uh, will need post-operative care of any residual uh, diplopia, as often, um, particularly with those that have uh, total complete third nerve palsies, you may cosmetically uh, make them better in prime position. However, they still will have limited movement of the extraocular muscles, in which case, as soon as they start moving their eyes, they'll have double vision and you'll need to manage that for them. Moving on to isolated uh, muscle palsies, here I've given you a table of the various extraocular muscle surgery that you can do for each of the isolated third nerve muscle palsies. I'm not going to go through each of them, but as per usual, what you will be looking at is the muscle sequelae. So if we have a look at the inferior rectus as an example, here we have the inferior rectus, uh, let's say it's a right, a right inferior rectus palsy. We have the option of strengthening the inferior rectus and we have the option of weakening the overacting contralateral synergist. We could also go over to the contralateral synergist, which is overacting, and um, weaken this particular superior oblique. Okay, so um, just bear in mind what your muscle sequelae is, which muscles could be strengthened and which muscles could be weakened in order to surgically correct the deviation. These patients obviously are going to be easier to manage than your uh, third nerve palsies, which have affected more than a single muscle. Okay, I thought I might just show you an example of a pre-op and post-op outcome of a patient. And here we have a patient who had a complete third nerve palsy. We can see the ptosis here, and this is with the ptosis um, lifted or the eyelid lifted. And we can see um, the classic out and slightly down eye in this particular instance. The patient had surgery. They had a recession of the lateral rectus. So this is the functioning lateral rectus. They've recessed it. 
And then they've also had the superior oblique, which is the functioning superior oblique, transposed. And there's also been run, uh, right upper lid frontalis suspension, which I've just said is, is not recommended that you do the uh, lid procedure at the same time as the strabismus procedure. I'm actually not sure whether they were done at the same time, but it does appear in this particular instance that perhaps it was uh, performed at the same time. So um, immediately postoperatively or, or days after, we can see that the patient actually looks relatively aligned here. It looks, it looks quite good. And uh, the lid is actually uh, a lot more elevated, which is great. And then as we um, see the patient three months later, we see that the eye has started to drift out slightly. And, and this patient has a 25 doctor XT in this position. And there's some residual ptosis as well. So this patient will um, clearly have some uh, diplopia in uh, prior inquisition that still needs to be managed and perhaps further surgery could be performed to, to assist the patient. Okay, so in summary, I have prepared a slide here with an overview of the variety of options um, that we have for a patient with a third nerve palsy. So here to the right, we have uh, the non-surgical options from prisms to occlusion to ptosis clutches. And these can be used uh, both preoperatively and postoperatively depending on, on your patient and, um, and their, uh, their nerve palsy and the outcome of surgery. And to the left here, we have a variety of options in relation to managing a patient with a third nerve palsy. Uh, again, this video hasn't gone through the extensive um, options that a surgeon has, uh, but rather given you an overview of some of the more common uh, surgeries performed to, to manage a third nerve palsy. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.